All right. How are we doing today? This is John Edmonds Cosma on your unimpressed podcast. And I'm unimpressed that Caitlin Chase has not been to Charleston, South Carolina yet with what she does. And hopefully she comes here soon. And I want to welcome her to the show. So welcome, Caitlin Chase. How are you doing today? For having me. I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? I see, you know, you have your saint caviar and cashmere. What's going on right now in the world of, of fashion? You know, I don't think people think about that with the, the pandemic and everything, but, it, you know, I think fashion has taken a pretty big hit right it now. It has, yeah. The fashion industry took a huge hit in 2020 because obviously everyone shifted to working from home and events were canceled, meetings, parties, weddings. So I think the large majority of the U.S. and actually all over the world transitioned to wearing sweats, which, uh, you know, wasn't great for, for fashion houses, but I think slowly but surely it will pick back up again. And I'm hopeful that once things get back to normal and people are out and about again, they'll want to spend and they will want to wear nice clothes and feel good and dress up again. So I'm, I'm optimistic for the future. What is your business? How do you make money? How do you monetize what you do? Give me a little bit of details on what that looks like. Yeah. So I am celebrating my 10th year of having my blog, which is called Caviar and Cashmere. I launched it in 2011 after a career in journalism. I was working for magazines, writing mostly about fashion and beauty. And then I started the blog 2011 to really just own my own content and write about the things that I loved and experienced from traveling all over the world. That blog is still around today and it has a pretty great readership. I have people that have followed along for for 10 years on the journey of growing that. And I was able to launch a skincare brand from the popularity of the blog and all of my experience and knowledge within the beauty industry. So in 2018, I launched my own branded skincare products, which are also called Caviar and Cashmere. And today I run both businesses simultaneously. So I have the blog and I have the skincare brand. What is your niche, if you will, with your skincare? So after writing about beauty for so many years, I was sent every skincare product under the sun from brands all over the world. And while a lot of them were great, I found that most of the skincare brands were touting these multi-step routines. I would get packages of 10 to 15, sometimes even 20 different skincare products that these brands were saying, you have to use all of these products on your face in order to look great and feel great. And I thought that was pretty unattainable for me and for the average woman. I started some candid conversations online with my audience and my followers on social media, and I wanted to see if other women felt the same way. And they did. They were just inundated with the sheer amount of products on the market. I wanted to solve this problem and just simplify it. I, I thought there has to be a better way that we can still look and feel our best without putting 10 products on our face. So I worked with a dermatologist and I was able to formulate a line that streamlines the skincare process and dwindles it down into just three steps. So instead of 10 or 15, it's just three products that you use every day for your skincare. I know Bobby Brown pretty well. Uh, my wife taught her kids in school cause in Montclair. So we lived in North Caldwell, New Jersey. And I see that you have a completely vegan product. Mine is vegan, cruelty-free, and clean. So non-toxic. We do not use any chemicals in the products. It's mostly botanical ingredients. My wife would like that because I think Bobby at, at some time or is doing that now is trying to move to some of our products to the vegan world. And another product I've known is uh, Revive. How does it compare to something like from a Bobby Brown to a Revive? Or is it Revive or Revive? What sets my line apart from everyone else is just the fact that the ingredients in all three products work simultaneously together to deliver the results that women desire in their skincare. And each product is formulated with really concentrated active botanical ingredients. 
And the difference is mostly just less products on the face and all while not having to sacrifice your health and be worried about things like sulfates or phthalates products that a lot of, you know, makeup and skincare, unfortunately has, which can affect people's health in a variety of different ways. A lot of the ingredients that they put in that are not clean, they're chemical or synthetic can affect uh, hormones, can affect, you know, all sorts of things. They seep into your blood system because skin is the largest organ on your body. And uh, we are, anything that we put on our face, we are ingesting essentially. So I just wanted to make sure that not only women could feel and look great, but also not sacrifice their health. Where did this stem from? This inspiration of having a great vegan product come from? I'm not, I myself am not a vegan. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I eat pretty clean and healthy, but when I was polling, I used my social media and my blog readership as market research. I was asking all of my followers what they desired in skincare. And one of the main things that people were saying was they desired vegan and cruelty-free products. So I just listened to the consumer and what they wanted, if it's vegan or not, in terms of my diet, because I myself am not a vegan, but happy to deliver what the people want. Has there been a uptick in sales with people being home with you having an online business or has it been the same or what does that look like through this pandemic? The pandemic was uh, interesting. It was a bit of a roller coaster and the sales kind of tied in with what was going on in the world. So it was very interesting when people were first staying at home starting in March, about March to June, the sales definitely increased. People were spending more time online shopping. Uh, Women had more time to devote to their skincare when maybe historically they would neglect it. I think women were spending more time on Zoom and they were noticing fine lines and wrinkles and things that they weren't happy about with their appearance. So the sales definitely increased and I was happy to have an online presence to be able to cater to the people that were online shopping. Uh, When things opened up again in the summertime, we noticed a little bit of a dip, which was interesting because people were out about again. They were socializing in public a little bit more and so they could cover their skin with makeup. They weren't really focusing on their skincare and then come fall and things got bad again and people were at home. Then the sales went up around uh, the fall and of course during the holiday. It's been interesting kind of tracking the sales and how they correlate with what's going on globally. Is there other profit positions you have with your social media besides the skincare? Often partner with other brands and I create content for them. So that's another line of revenue that I have is the partnerships on the blog and my own social media. I met this girl in, at Soho House in New York who like it now. Is it is it like it now? She has about 5,000 influencers. Is there any correlation with what you do and something similar? Or have y'all ever worked together? The affiliate platform, there's a couple of them where people like me, content creators, are able to monetize by using affiliate links and getting commission off of sales of things that they post and they wear. I do not use Like to Know It. I use another one, which is called Shop Style, but they're both essentially the same. What's your go-to brand? Is there any go-to brand that you work with on a, a consistent basis? The brands that I work with are typically luxury in the fashion, beauty, and travel space. And I have a few partnerships, long-term partnerships with hospitality brands, with fashion brands, cosmetic, that uh, we work together on a pretty consistent basis and in a variety of different ways. And I'm very grateful to be able to have relationships that I've worked with the same brand for five, six, seven years. What's the relationship I see here with uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel? What have you done with that hotel? Hills Hotel is part of the Dorchester collection and they have a variety of different hotels branded under different names under that one Dorchester umbrella. And I've worked with a variety of their hotels all over the world to create content for them. A great uh, nostalgic pick here. Uh, your photo with the hotel is pretty cool. Uh, I've always loved that place because of the history. You know, you can go in there anytime and no telling who you're going to run into. Uh, pretty cool spot the most iconic hotels in the world. And I can't think of many hotels that have such uh, noticeable branding. So as soon as someone sees the Palm 
print or the pink and green stripes, they automatically associate it with the Beverly Hills Hotel. And not many hotels have done that in the past. So they've done an incredible job at marketing and branding themselves. What do the days look like now in LA? I mean, what does your day look like? Presently, (laughs) it looks a lot different now than it did a year ago, unfortunately. A year ago, uh, I was on a plane almost every three to four weeks traveling around, whether it was for the skincare, for the blog. But uh, now I am mostly working from home and I go out to create content. I'm still doing partnerships. And so I visit properties and uh, I have shoots all over the city and obviously not really traveling that much, but I have been able to work with a variety of hotels in the Southern California area. So do you have family, you have kids? Uh, No, not yet. Okay. Hopefully one day. (laughs) And where are you at? Where are you at exactly in Beverly Hills? I am in the flats, if you're familiar with Beverly Hills. So I'm in the flats, uh, very close to Rodeo Drive, a few blocks away. You said you grew up in Malibu. Obviously, your family's there, mom and dad. My parents, uh, they were in Malibu for 35 years, and they recently moved over to Westlake Village. So still very close. Westlake's about 20 minutes from Malibu. So uh, they're there. We're very, very close. I see them often. And I have a sister that lives down the street from me. Do you get to see your family during the pandemic or y'all social distancing? How do you handle that? It's been uh, interesting because my family is just so close knit and used to spending a lot of time together. So we've been careful, but still spending time together, getting tested regularly to make sure that everyone is being safe and uh, doing a little bit of social distancing when we're spending time. But we have made it a point to not let it affect our relationships and be able to spend time together. So I'm very grateful that everyone has stayed healthy and we've been able to just get tested regularly and make sure that everyone is safe. Have you noticed something that kind of stands out with this going on in LA that's completely different than you've ever experienced? I mean, is there one little particular thing that stands out? A lot of things stand out and so much has changed. I think I, you know, I don't like to talk too much about politics, but I think that the pandemic has been grossly mishandled by the government here in California, the governor, uh, the mayor of LA. Um, They just haven't done much in in terms of supporting small businesses. And the numbers here right now were mid-January, and they are the worst that they are in the country. So LA is currently the epicenter of the pandemic. And that's even with many of the businesses being shut for a long time. A lot has changed, and I really feel for the small businesses, the restaurants in the area, and everyone that's been really struggling with all of the shutdowns. And LA is such a social city. People are always out and about walking out out to lunch, out to dinner, getting drinks. The hotels are always packed and it's just done a complete 180. It's quiet. Barely anyone's on the street. Obviously, no one's at restaurants because they are closed. And um, just the energy has shifted. But I'm hoping that things will get back to normal and everyone will get back on their feet. But I really feel for everyone in this city. It's been a long year for everyone. And um, I just wish that it would it would get better. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful with the vaccine rolling out and hopefully things can, you know, normalize a little bit come spring. Yeah, it's kind of a similar story uh, in New Jersey. I mean, it's, um, you know, shutting down New York City and seeing, you know, 90% of the businesses just completely go out of business is a very, very interesting thing. Uh, one of the things I noticed, uh, especially in New York, you don't really notice when it's a normal situation, but now you're seeing some interesting characters outside doing certain things that kind of stand out now because there's not a lot of people on the street. Yeah, I feel like that often. I have a dog and I walk him multiple times per day and usually there's people out and about and they're saying hello to each other and everyone is quite social and friendly and now there's barely anyone on the street and if there is another person on the street they immediately cross so it's it's as if we've become 
enemies in our own city because no one wants to get close to each other. No one's saying hello through their mask. It's really unfortunate. I really just miss talking to strangers and interfacing with people on a day-to-day basis. And that's just not happening right now. What kind of dog you have? I have a very large golden doodle. Golden doodle. Oh, okay. Golden cool. retriever poodle mix. One of my comedians has has two of those. Really smart, just all around good dogs. And I'm so thankful to have him during all of this because he's been a reason to get outside when I'm working from home and take him on a walk and get some fresh air. So it's been a a real blessing having a dog. What has been your most exciting time with your business? Exciting place, exciting time uh, where you just felt like this is where I need to be. I love what I do. Was there any like moment where you realized something like that? A couple of years ago in in 2018, right before I launched the skincare brand, I was invited uh, to be a delegate to represent the U.S. beauty industry in Israel. And I worked with the Israeli government, the Foreign Trade Commission, and they brought me over and I met with a variety of different cosmetic and beauty brands over there and was helping consult on how they could break into the U.S. market. And that was just a pivotal point in my career that I it was not only gratifying and fulfilling being over there and helping other brands, but also just realizing that all of the work that I've put in for all of those years was being recognized globally. And it was It was really great, humbling experience to be amongst a bunch of Israeli cosmetic beauty brands that have been in business for 20, 30, 40 years, never been able to break into the the U.S. market and just being able to help them and communicate with them. It was was really interesting and I loved that experience. Having the experiences like that and then having this experience this past year. Has your strategy changed moving forward? Is there new ideas? Is there something that you think can put you ahead of the curve? Because a lot of times when things happen like this, you know, there's a lot of discovery of different ways to take your business and so forth. Has anything like that happened with you? A ton of uh, brainstorming and pivoting. And I think that the, the one silver lining to come from this is just being able to transition and go with the flow and be nimble in your business because things happen that are out of your control and you have to think on your feet quickly. I'm grateful to have a very small team. So I'm able to move quick and make adjustments accordingly and and be really scrappy. And as something isn't working, try to try something else until it does work and see what sticks. I think the the biggest shift will be just more focused on e-commerce and and digital presence because I think for a long time, People will still want to be shopping primarily online. I think that the beauty industry as a whole is going to see a maybe forever shift in the way that people shop. I don't think that many people will be going into department stores and wanting to try the products on, interface with the the salespeople. Um, I don't think that there'll be testers anymore. People won't be able to interact with the product like they used to. Brands are really going to have to find a way to reach the new customers online and communicate their their messaging and their, their product um, USPs in a unique way so people feel confident trying new products online instead of discovering them at the stores. You think there's some brands that aren't going to make it? I mean, I know a lot of brick and mortars have left, you know, Fifth Avenue in New York. How does a brand survive? in this day and time. Have to be innovative and have to have a a unique selling point and really stand out from the crowd, especially online. It can be really difficult. There's so much competition. So just being, being really unique and having something to offer that is unlike any other brand and really making sure that online their social presence is uh, first and foremost you know, at the forefront of their strategy and marketing is just making sure that they are getting in right in front of the right people at the right time, knowing where your customers are and uh, communicating with them in the way in which they want to be messaged. Kind of my thought process is if you have a, if someone has a big identity and you see some, some people out there with these big identities, I think JLo just came out with her own line and when they start from scratch like that, right? And then you take, say, uh, say a L'Oreal, just for example, right? Who has tremendous overhead 
and has to down tap that overhead, right, to go towards a direction of being online and that transition and that cost, I think that's going to give an identity like a JLo because they know where they're starting because they're starting at a different place uh, where th- some of these identities may take a lead on some major, major brands because of cash, I would think, you know, from a business perspective. Have you seen anything like that where it's been a struggle for a big like brand like L'Oreal to to transition, downsize their money and and try to figure out a big online presence? Do you see stuff like that in the in the marketplace? That some of the legacy brands that have been around for decades um, have struggled with their online presence, been a bit slower to transition. And uh, I think that that has uh, not allowed them to grow online as quickly as the other brands that are digitally native, that they know all of the ins and outs of D2C. And they've been able to really pivot and uh know how to market to the customers online. Whereas some of the older historical brands um, that didn't have much of an online presence and there's all this bureaucracy within the organizations, it takes longer for them to uh, get all of their marketing dollars in place. And sometimes they fall behind because they aren't as small and nimble as some of the newer startup brands. Yeah. Nimble, nimble is a big word. I mean, I, I've moved my studio here to Charleston and I have my house, right? My house is upstairs. My, I have a two-bedroom apartment, so about 1,200 square feet downstairs that we made the studio. So when I get out of bed, I just walk down the stairs and we, we go to work. I do have one, one other question. Caviar and Cashmere brand. How did you come up with that brand? So I wanted to have a name that denoted luxury automatically when someone heard it. And the two first things that came to mind that were some of my favorite luxury products happened to be caviar and cashmere. And I thought it sounded really good together. And it just so happened to be my initials as well, CC, Caitlin Chase. And I thought of it the same day as I wanted to, or I decided that I wanted to start a blog. I I thought of the name and I never looked back. It's been 10 years and People seem to love the name and I'm really happy that I I came up with it so quickly because a lot of people mull over their brand names for God knows how long and get all these different people's inputs and um, they get really confused on the branding, but I was able to just kind of go with my gut and stick with it and really happy that I did. When you started the blog, what was your thought process and how has your thought process transitioned till now after 10 years? When I started the blog, I was working at a magazine. I was a staff writer and I was running their website, all of their content. And that website was getting a ton of traffic, but there was some issues internally uh, with the C-level executives that made them have to file for chapter 11 and the magazine was going to close. So I thought quickly on my feet and I knew I, in the back of my head, wanted to start my own website and blog. So I asked for permission to start linking out from that website to my new website. So all of the traffic that was going to that magazine site then was being linked to my new blog. So that was my thought process in starting. And it was a great leg up to start with that traffic. And uh, I was able to retain the traffic because they liked what I was putting out there. So I got lucky in that standpoint. Um, today I, I've just been trying very hard to write about topics that people are interested in about. So I do a lot of research on trends and figure out what's going on in the different categories and industries that I'm interested in and that I cover like fashion and beauty and travel and try to stay on top of it and, and create content that is valuable and informational. So people have a reason to keep coming back to the blog. Do you do much video? I see you've got some done some podcast and TV appearances. Do you personally do any video yourself? But really dabbled in video, not because I don't like it. It's more for a lack of time. I'm a little bit spread thin, but one day I would love to venture into doing video. It's um, it's on my list of things to do. How about partnering with an identity? Is that do you want to hold this brand close to your chest, 
or do you, would you want to bring in like an identity to help push the product even further? Um, an identity like a celebrity? Celebrity, yes. Celebrity type. I'm open to it. Uh, a couple of people have come to me offering that and it would just have to be the right person. Um, I think partnering is like a marriage and mm -hmm. you spend a lot of time with the person and you're, you know, you got to make sure that you're on the same page and have the same core values and they understand the mission of the brand. So it's, it's not a no, but no one has come along yet that I was interested in partnering with, but that's not to say that someone won't come along that will pique my interest. So I'm open to it. If you're a celebrity out there and interested in caviar and cashmere, go see Caitlin Chase, beautiful lady. She's got a good Thank business, you. good business, entrepreneur, built this from the, you built this from scratch, I, I would imagine, right? Yeah, from scratch, completely self-funded. That's, that's a big deal. So I know you're very, very passionate about it. And yes, I appreciate you coming on the, the podcast today. This has been your Unimpressed Podcast, and I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bain Productions.